If it is safe to do so, take a look around you right now. Go on. See that car in the lane next to you? It needs an oil change. That house across the street? It needs to be painted and the furnace filter replaced. Oh, and the flower bed out front? It needs to be weeded. And don't even get me started on the boat under the tarp in the driveway. Everything needs occasional maintenance and upkeep. Vehicles, homes, pets, our earthly bodies, heck, even relationships. It's an ongoing requirement for virtually everything and anything. And that most certainly includes a 1,000-foot-long, 10-story-tall, $8 billion nuclear-powered aircraft carrier that sails the world's seas, protecting the nation's interests. If you want a lethal spear, you need to spend a little time sharpening it, as we learned this week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here are your hosts, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilots, Vincent Aiello and Brian Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. This is episode 49. We're titling it Sharpening the Spear. My name is Jello and joining me back from the high seas is our co-host, Sunshine. What's up, dude? Hey, Jello. It's great to be back off the boat. Well, I bet. So let's see. Two episodes ago, you told us you'd be gone for a little bit. We did the Panavia tornado without you. But now that you're back, remind us where you were and what you were doing. Yeah, absolutely. I spent about two weeks participating in something called Northern Edge. And it's an exercise, joint exercise between the Air Force and the Navy. It took place in the vicinity of Alaska. I spent a week on the carrier, as in the Theodore Roosevelt. And I spent a week on the beach or there at the uh, Jaber, we call it. So it's a joint base Elmendorf-Richardson. Now on the boat, I had a great opportunity to train some of the younger pilots and actually some of the older pilots on a relatively new weapon called JSAL C1, which is a network-enabled weapon. So it's a, basically it's your typical precision-guided munition that we use anti-surface, but we threw in a radio to it, so now it's got Wi-Fi capability. So you can update the target as you launch it, and it's, it's running downrange. That's amazing. Now, granted, you were only on the carrier for a week, but what's it like to be out there and not flying? That's got to be miserable. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> you bring up a good point. So last time I was on a boat and we were underway was 2010. And I must admit wow. that, yeah, I must admit that it smells, tastes, looks, and feels the same as I remember it. So, but you know what I was missing was absolutely that basically hour and a half of liberty, if you will. Uh, yes. Yeah, I did support some launches from the tower. So I'd go up, see the light of day see some of my buddies up there, like the, uh, the mini and whatnot, and then um, watch the guys as they took off. And we, we'd support the launches, make sure the weapons are working on deck. And then just watching those launches, man, brought back just a flood of great memories. Oh, I'm sure. And by the mini, of course, you mean the mini boss, one of the folks up there that are helping coordinate all the dances on the flight deck, as it were. Absolutely. And so what a great segue for today's episode, because you are out there not quite on the very tip of the spear, but you guys were doing some workups, getting everybody prepared for eventually deploying. And even out in that setting, I have to think you were the benefactor of a lot of what goes on behind the scenes that we're going to talk about today with just keeping not just the aircraft, but the overall aircraft carrier operational. Yeah, there was a lot of opportunity to see the guys making sure that the boat works. I mean, all the different life support systems on board is pretty crazy. Even saw them painting hatches and whatnot, just getting things ready for the deployment that's coming up down the road. Well, it never ends. You know, it's a nonstop process, and that's what we'll talk all about here in our interview coming up in just a little bit. Yeah, but hey, Jell, I want to take a little segue here, and uh, on a more serious note, can you tell us about your dad? Uh, I appreciate you asking. So, yes, my 93-year-old father, who's a World War II veteran, is not doing real well. He stopped eating a few days ago. Oh. And according to my sister, who's there helping him, he's not drinking now, which, of course, oh won't work out too well. Yeah. So we all know it's coming. I mean, it it's coming someday for all of us, uh, sooner, presumably, for some than others. And we're just kind of holding our breath. But, yeah, it is, uh, it's kind of sad to to watch him deteriorate. I appreciate you asking. You bet, man. I'm, I'm sorry to hear, and I, I will keep him in my prayers. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Well, hey, let's uh, do some announcements, and then we have time today 
for some listener questions. Outstanding. Now, recently we had a musing post by our former guest Farva, the LSO Farva, that is, and uh, he reflected on Memorial Day. So we released that on Memorial Day, reflecting on what that holiday means. And we also released another behind the scenes video on our YouTube channel, this one again with our former guest Dud. And on that particular episode, we talked about some different aircraft carrier landing emergencies, such as some mishaps, barricades, and some last minute corrections that didn't go too well for one particular F-18. So head on over to our YouTube channel or Patreon to check those out. All right, Sunshine, we have time for some questions. Why don't I send the first one to you? This is from Andy. He wants to know, how is a squadron organized? What additional duties do pilots have? And I presume he means pilots in, in the case of the two-seat squadrons, the Wizzos. And he also goes on, what non-flying billets are there? What ranks and rates fulfill all these billets? And are Marine squadrons organized in the same way? So we could be here all day on this, but what are some high-level stuff? Let's start at the top, Sunshine. Who's leading the squadron? And then talk to us about the middle management and their general roles, and then somewhat what the JOs are doing. Okay, yeah. So these additional duties, we traditionally coin them or call them ground jobs. And the mm -hmm. ground jobs, you're right. So the squadron is going to consist of anywhere from a fifth level officer, 05, all the way down to sometimes even an 01 will sneak in maybe as an intel or a, a wizzo, if you will. So yep. starting at the top, though, the 05, you got the skipper or the commanding officer and then the executive officer. And this is where it's going to change a little or be a little different between the Navy and the Marine Corps. So in the Navy, the XO is going to fleet up into the skipper position, whereas in the Marine Corps squadrons, the XO position is more of a rotation for the department heads, which leads me into the next tier, if you will, stepping down. That would be the 04 tier, and that's going to mm -hmm. be the, the middle management, we'll call it, and those would be the department right. heads. And the departments could be operations, maintenance, safety, and administration, typically, right. plus yep. or minus a couple. And stepping now below the O4s would be the O3s, the O1s, and those are going to be the division officer and branch officer billets, if you will. So they're going to be in charge of smaller work centers, and they're going to work, obviously, for the uh, department heads, and the department heads work for the CO and XO. That's right. So in the operations department, for example, you might have the folks doing the flight schedule every day. Absolutely. you got flight schedule, and then in maintenance, as you could imagine, they're maintaining the ready basic aircraft requirements, so making sure all the jets are ready to go. That's right. And then you might have in safety an ATOPS officer, and then you might have someone in admin. And it's worth pointing out that in a typical squadron of single-seat aircraft, you might have maybe 16 pilots or so, mm -hmm. but in a two-seat squadron, you'll have double that. So you might have assistants of everything, like an assistant operations officer or assistant training officer. And then, of course, you'll have different folks running around in maintenance. So it just depends on the size of your squadron. And then, of course, below that, within the departments, you've got your chief petty officers and all of your sailors, all the way down to your new recruits that show up fresh out of uh, boot camp. Yeah, and Jello, you bring up a good point about the number of air crew. We'll call it the ready room content, either the, the two-seat versus the one-seat. But regardless of how many officers they have, they still have the same number of critical billets. Now, you may have the assistance, as you mentioned, but did you notice on the carrier that the single-seat guys tended to have less free time than the dual-seat guys? Well, anecdotally, yes, but that was because I was looking at it from that side of the fence. And so it could have been different. I never was deployed in a two-seat squadron. I flew with those guys as air wing operations officer. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it did seem like there was a lot more of them, but I have to think they kept them gamefully employed. Oh, I agree, too. Just I think sometimes there's a, uh, a perception and people may ask, hey, is a single-seat versus two-seat, is it the same number of jobs? And I would say everyone is very gainfully employed in both squadrons. Yep, I agree. Good question, Andy. Cool. Okay, next one is from Alex. Alex asks, despite being part of a big team and having a live connection via data link to your fellows, as in fellow pilots, I guess fellow air crew, mm -hmm. did you ever have a moment where you felt alone in your cockpit? Well, first off, Alex, I think it's worth pointing out that we don't always jump into the data link net. There's a bit of requirement for that on the card that you load up that you carry with you into the aircraft to make sure that you have the right cryptology and everything's ready to go. And so we don't always get into the net, as it's called. Now, Sunshine, I don't know about you, but for me, the loneliest, to Alex's point, that I ever was, was I decided it would be a good idea one time returning from a BFM debt 
at Top Gun from Key West, instead of going around the coast of Florida, okay. I made a run for it. It went from Key West direct to Houston. And in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, you're uh -oh. not talking to anyone. No. And I was flying by myself and it was quiet for about 20 minutes. And I tell you, that was eerie because I thought, <laughs> man, if I have a problem right now, I hope they come find me because I, you know, so when I got to the next agency and could reach someone in Houston Center. Uh, it was kind of nice to hear them. So yeah, that was about the only time. But other than that, you generally always have a wingman to talk to or someone who's controlling you. But uh, do you ever have anything like that? No, nothing of that kind of uh, protracted time, I'd say. But for me, even just the night launches and uh, also prior to recovery at night, the night marshal stack, mm -hmm. even though I know there are guys above and below me, I kind of felt like I was on my own just kind of setting up my cockpit for the, the final Hurrah, which would be the landing. And also at the depot. So Jello, when you flew at the depot, I know we flew in the open. It wasn't very far off the coast. But did you ever feel kind of alone and unafraid there? Uh, I wouldn't say alone, but I guess it was just nice to get away, right? So it'd be like if you're in a crowd all the time and there's some place you can just move away and you can still see the crowd, but you can just get a little peace and quiet. I definitely felt that, particularly, I'm sure you felt the same thing as toward the end of our careers. Of course, there was a bit of, oh, I don't know, um, nostalgia maybe that every time I went out flying, I just kind of knew it was almost over. And so that added to the emotional side of it. But yeah, I think, I think you're right. And, and to your point about the night landings, you're right. You know, that's, as I've said before, kind of as close to heaven as you can get on earth is when you're up there waiting for the uh, sun to set and it's your turn to come down. Uh, but, you know, Marshall's always transmitting or someone's always calling. So you're never truly alone in that case. Good point. Indeed. All right, next. Hey, you know what? I started playing this phone call last week, but I punted. So uh, let's let you hear it. Hi, Joe. This is Paul calling from Los Angeles. I got a question for Sunshine. Would a plane with anhedral wings have more problems pulling Gs because the wings are already in a sort of downward position? Conversely, would a plane with dihedral wings have more stable structure and be able to support pulling higher Gs? Anyway, love the show. Thanks for your time. Hey, Paul, thanks for your question. And uh, sorry to miss it earlier, but Jello, <laughs> I did like how you presented that. <laughs> now, when it, when it comes to anhedral versus dihedral, I wouldn't think of it so much as the ability to pull Gs or what we call pitch authority. That angular position of the wings, we'll call it dihedral effect, is more critical in roll stability. So when you're thinking of an aircraft, for example, in spiral mode, more so than pitch. Now, unless you're touching on a very obscure term called longitudinal dihedral, which, let me back up a little bit. So in math, dihedral is an angular difference between any two planes. And traditionally, when we're looking at planes, we look at left and right, or we look at the wings. But you could also look fore and aft. So you could look at the zero lift line plane of the wing and the zero lift line plane of the horizontal stab or stabilizer. And those two could actually create some difference and, and become a factor in not so much pitch authority as they do in speed stability or kind of the fugoid motion, as they call it. Whoa. Yeah, so to make a long answer longer, <laughs> I would say it's, it's apples and oranges. So the, the shape of the wings, I don't expect engineers to see a lot of additional stress or strain on the wing boxes because of their anhedral or dihedral configuration when pulling Gs, nor do they really contribute or detract from the pitch authority, which is going to directly relate to pulling Gs. Okay. So I hope that answered the question. All right, so just for the knuckleheads out there like me, so in other words, a Harrier with its anhedral is not necessarily negatively or positively impacted when it's just doing, let's say, a pure loop by the angle of its wings relative to the fuselage. Yeah, I would think more of pitch authority. Think of the control surfaces along the longitudinal axis like the canards or the stabilators mm. or the uh, uh, excuse me, elevators. You got it. Okay. All right. Excellent. All right. Next up is Brian Biddle. He's one of our friends from Orange County, California. He's got a simulator up there that he hires out for folks. And he asks, do Navy fighter pilots partake in the Jeremiah weed like the Air Force <laughs> fighter pilots? Sunshine, I'm going to answer this one quickly because I have no idea what Jeremiah weed is. I thought I heard it was a whiskey, but he says to partake in the Jeremiah weed. So I don't know. What do you know about this? Yeah. So uh, good old bourbon whiskey, as in, uh, I always think of this kind of whiskey as made in Kentucky. So bourbon whiskey. Okay. It's a, it's, it's, it's pretty potent there at 90 proof. Oof. And then there's also another version. It's a hundred proof. It's made out of Connecticut, but um, 
I'll tell you what, Jello, whenever I think of Jeremiah Weed, I think of the song, and then I think of the band Dos Gringos. So have you ever heard of those mm-hmm. guys? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so I would say uh, Jeremiah Weed, not so much. Uh, I'm more of a Gentleman Jack kind of guy. But uh, when it comes to Dos Gringos, that's something that the Air Force pilots and the Navy pilots tend to share and enjoy. That would be the the lyrics, the delightful lyrics of Snooze and uh, Trip. I think their names are. Call signs. <laughs> well, maybe we should get those guys on the show. There you sometime. go. <laughs> Cool. All right. The next question is from Grigori Kaplan in Israel. All right. And he asked Jello, could you please describe in detail how pilots from different squadrons interact with each other? Are they permitted to come into each other's ready rooms? Are there any joint meetings? Was it possible that some experienced Tomcat pilot could teach some air-to-air tactics to a Hornet pilot or vice versa? And is it possible if a pilot for some reason is having a flight on a plane that belongs to another squadron of the same type? Any kind of interesting details would be appreciated. Well, good question, Grigori. So I never had any conflict with pilots from other squadrons. I mean, sure, there's a healthy little rivalry between you want to be the best squadron. But when it comes right down to it, you could have just as easily been in VFA X as Y. And so everyone's trying to do their best. And that's a good thing. So I I never had any trouble with interactions with others. I mean, are there some people you get along naturally better with than others? Sure. But I never had any trouble. Um, Yes, you are permitted into others ready rooms. And it's quite often the case when you are flying together, that you will go down there to brief, even if it's just a quick coordination brief. Typically, you wouldn't just pop into someone else's ready room without needing some sort of business if you weren't there for a brief. But if you were looking for someone, you could certainly pop in and and take care of business. Uh, Sure, there are joint meetings all the time. There are joint briefings. They can happen in each other's ready rooms or in Civic, as we've called it before on the show. And yes, not just Tomcat pilots, but any other pilot could brief other ready rooms. In fact, when I left Top Gun and was a training officer in VFA 97, I remember going around to some of the other squadrons on no-fly days and doing some chalk talks on different subjects, just because I had just left the burning bush, if you will. And so I was as fresh on that information as anyone would be. And so I was wanting to share that with the fleet. That's the whole point of Top Gun. And lastly there, Sunshine, I can remember maybe once or twice in my career, someone from, let's say, VFA-82 flying a VFA-86 jet back when we both flew Charlie's on the John F. Kennedy or George Washington in the late 90s. But generally, that wasn't the case. It was only if one squadron maybe was really on its heels maintenance-wise or if what's called a red stripe comes out where it downs all of one particular lot of jets. And so for whatever reason, your squadron, your sister squadron, let's say, wasn't able to fly, but you wanted to keep them proficient in the day or two while that red stripe was being taken care of. You might help each other out then, but I think that was pretty rare. Sunshine, what do you got to add to all that? Nah, pretty much same experience. I agree with you. I would almost think of on the carrier, someone else's ready rooms as your friend's house, right? So you can drop in, say hi, but you you got to, you know, usually you have a reason and you don't hang out too long, but it's all, <laughs> like you said earlier, right? We're all on the same team, so... That's right. Not that big. Yeah, you don't just uh, you don't just pop into their living room and kick your feet. What's up? up? Yeah, (laughs) there's a little bit of decorum involved. Yeah, exactly. Uh, That's right. All right. So last question for today, Sunshine. I'll put it to you. It's from Emery at the University of Central Florida. How much of an advantage are academy officers over ROTC officers? I've heard once you get to an undergraduate pilot training, it doesn't matter where you're commissioned from, just how well you can handle the stick. So Sunshine, what it sounds like Emery is asking is how much of a difference does it make in flight school? But let me expand the question to you and say, how much does it matter in the rest of your career? Yeah, so Emery, thanks for the question. And Jello being an, an ROTC product as you are, I'm going to say that the Academy guys are just playing better. So uh, that's the end. I'm just kidding. Not at all. Not at all. That is not the case in the least. So the advantages that I found during my career of being an Academy guy is when you get to flight school, you have a bigger cadre of existing friends. Not to say that you're not going to make some great friendships in flight school. So really very little difference there. And then after I retired, the networking piece was huge, especially in finding a follow-on job. So the Academy to me, is a great place to be from, as all the Academy guys pretty much say. And that's because of the networking potential that is now there. Mm. But during flight school and during my commission service of 21 years, 
no big advantage of being an academy versus ROTC, even versus OCS. How about you, Jello? Well, the only thing I would slightly disagree with on that is when you are an ROTC student, you put on your uniform twice a week and you might have some other excursions and certainly over the summer you do, but so do the academy guys. Okay. But you're not really living it day in and day out. So for me, there was a bit of an adjustment oh. when I was commissioned and moved to Pensacola because suddenly I was living it day in and day out. So it's possible, oh, okay. although I only have my one experience, that the guys coming from the academy, I mean, they were they were locked on. They knew all about the military bearing and what you do and don't do. And, and they have lived it, breathed it, you know, ate it, slept it for the last four years, whereas I was maybe going through some growing pains day in and day out. So, but, but again, I, it's hard to ever do a scientific test on that, I guess, because a person only gets the one experience or the other. Uh, but the other thing I would add is that it seems to me anecdotally that a lot of admirals are from the academy. And I don't know if it just, the experience there kind of imbues itself into you and they are more likely to percolate into the top tiers. But it seems to me that you'll see a lot of admirals who are from the academy and you almost say, yeah, no surprise. And so I, I don't know if that is causal or just correlation or what, but, um, you know, I, I will, I will admit I tried to go to the Academy and was not accepted. I think I've mentioned that before on the show. So I always felt like maybe if you compare the two, the Academy guy had the leg up, but when it comes right down to it, to your point, sunshine, you get to flight school. If you and I fly the exact same flight and it's right on the edge of, is this or is this not passing? They're not going to give you a pass and me a fail just because you went to the academy and I went to the ROTC. It either meets the standards or it doesn't. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you look like, what's in your underwear. Uh, I wonder if I should re-record re, re that, but that's the best way to put it. At least it shouldn't. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, it's just what can you do? And that's uh, that's all there is to say about that. I agree, <laughs> especially about the underwear. You're not going to touch that one. Huh? <laughs> no, uh, we're good. All so, right. Uh, Excellent. That was awesome. Cool. All right. Well, Sunshine, let's get into the interview. Now, it will be abundantly clear in a moment, but let's just prime the pump a little bit. Sure. We on the show and Hollywood talk a lot about what it is to be out there on the tip of the spear, flying the aircraft, dropping the bombs, shooting the missiles sailing into harm's way, all those things that they make movies about mm -hmm. are sensational. And we spend a lot of time talking about it, but can we sustain that all the time? I mean, what do you think, Sunshine? Can we just be out there all day, hundred percent of the time? Absolutely not. Especially if you want people to have a life separate from the Navy and be able to come home, kiss their wives and their kids, you know, and, and have an individual identity. So no, Jello, it's not no, totally sustainable. That's right. Not just the time away, but just the maintenance that is required to keep the aircraft and the carrier going. And these aircraft carriers, man, they are complicated. They're huge. If you've never had a chance to see one, there are museums at all the different corners of the United States. Go check one out. But today, we're going to hear from the commanding officer and the project lead on just what goes on when an aircraft carrier is not on the tip of the spear to keep it ready to go when it is its turn. And so let's get into the interview with the Carl Vinson staff up in the Pacific Northwest. Today, the Fighter Pilot Podcast is in the Pacific Northwest. We are in Bremerton, Washington, and we are on, well, we're not really on the USS Carl Vinson. We're right next to it. <laughs> and we are joined by the Carl Vinson Commanding Officer, United States Navy Captain Matt Paradise, call sign Pappy. Pappy, welcome to the show. Hey, Jello, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming up to the PAC Northwest. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, I spent almost 25 years in the Navy. I'd never been up here. So I'm glad to come check it out and quite a scene out there. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's absolutely an industrial complex. We are grinding sausage like, uh, like gangbusters <laughs> down there from, uh, from scaffolding. Uh, we're, we're ripping parts off the ship. It's, uh, things are really heating up down there. It's good to see. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. And that really is the theme of the discussion today is we spend so much time on this show talking about the very tip of the spear. And most listeners and viewers out there only think of what you see on the news or in movies. But there's a lot that goes on behind that. But before we find out about that, let's find out about you. Who are you? Where are you from? And what have you been doing in the Navy? What are you doing now? 
Yeah, so believe it or not, the uh, Pag Northwest is my home. I grew up in Tacoma, specifically Lakewood, went to high school here, and went to University of Washington, part one, I guess I should say. <laughs> uh, had a great time, didn't do a lot of studying, Uh-oh. and so very quickly found myself uh, enlisting in the Navy and heading down to San Diego. From there, I saw all these guys running around with boats on their heads, and that looked like a pretty good gig. And so I went to BUDS, Class 138, and then eventually to SEAL Team 2, where I was uh, in a platoon for a workup cycle, a deployment cycle, and then back into the training department where I got picked up for enlisted commissioning program. Excellent. So University of Washington Part 2, much more mature <laughs> Did a lot more studying and then got my commission in, I guess, 92. And I'd always wanted to be a pilot. Certainly that's uh, sort of uh, my head was always uh, up looking in the sky when I was a kid. And so I was pretty dedicated on the second time around and uh, got myself into flight school. I made it through flight school, uh, uh, selected Hornets and went to Lemoore, uh, went through the Charlie rag there and uh, then on into a squadron. Uh, Did uh, my squadron tour, went to Pax River, went through test pilot school, a couple years of developmental test out at VX-23. And then uh, after that, I went to Japan as a CAG paddles, uh, stayed out there for my department head tour, and uh, then straight to Belgium for my joint tour. After that, selected for commanding officer and was the skipper of uh, VFA-34 out in Oceania. And so... (laughs) After that tour, selected nuclear power, took a long time learning about neutrons and uh, all the technical aspects of nuclear power, and then uh, fast forward uh, a f- an EXO tour, a deep draft tour, here I am as a commanding officer of Carl Vinson. And what an honor that must be. I can't figure out how we did not cross paths prior to today, <laughs> because I also was commissioned in 92, also went straight to... F-18s, but I went to Cecil and then out to Fallon and probably was in Lemoore after you when you were in Japan. So, all right, well, somewhere we might have bumped into each other at a tailhook or oak club or something. (laughs) But anyway, it's good to come up and meet you. And I just want to point out, as you know, on the show, we tried to explain acronyms that you and I take for granted, but BUDS being the basic underwater demolition slash SEAL training course, six months, very arduous. The fact that you made it through that is a testament to your uh, hard work, apparently, at that point on, because like you said, you're at <laughs> University of Washington Part 1. All right, cool. Yep. Well, we are going to talk about your experiences here in the uh, shipyard, if you will, in Bremerton. And, you know, as the podcast listeners know, my Navy career began and ended on Carl Vinson. My TA-4, I'm guessing you also qualified in that airplane? I, I actually was a uh, T-45 guy the oh, whole way you were. through. Okay. One of, the, one of the first classes. Okay. Yeah. I was, they offered that to us, and I wanted to fly the Skyhawk while there was still a chance. So yeah. my very first trap in the Navy was aboard the Carl Vinson off the coast of San Diego in 1995. And, Pappy, I'm afraid to admit, but it was a one-wire. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then at the end of 2016, another Pappy, who was the XO of the time at the time, He allowed me, as did the rest of the ship's leadership, to hold my retirement ceremony on Carl Vinson. And so I have an affinity for the ship, but I never deployed on it. Uh, And I'm wondering what's happened with the ship and what's it been up to since then? Well, I could tell you 2018 was a busy year. Okay. Uh, We spent, uh, I think, 193 days away at sea. Uh, That included a three-month deployment. During that deployment, we went to Vietnam, first aircraft carrier to pull into Vietnam for over 40 years. Wow. That was pretty exciting. Um, after that, uh, there's a couple CQ uh, debts out there kind of mixed in. Mm-hmm. Uh, we went on RIMPAC after that, Rim of the Pacific, 50 surface ships, 26 nations, uh, and pretty big exercise. It was, it was uh, a lot of fun. As we were getting ready to go into the yards, we did a sustainment exercise. And so as uh, our training and readiness was sort of uh, timing out, if you will, uh, you know, there's you're on the tip of the spear all the way up until you're not, until you're in the shipyards. And so that sustainment exercise was designed to get the battle group together one last time to practice all the things that we need to do to be uh, combat ready. 
Uh, and then early in this year, we came up to the great Northwest, uh, went over to Pier Delta on the other side of the Nimitz, and uh, we, got, uh, we got ready to go. So we unloaded all the cars. Uh, we did a month of early start, it's called, where we're essentially uh, moving everybody off the ship, uh, taking down air conditioning, potable water, uh, all that kind of stuff in preparation for the dead stick over to the dry dock. So and mm -hmm. that's where we are now. Cool. Well, I look forward to hearing more about that. Now, the typical air show attendee, he enjoys the performances by, let's say, the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds, and I'm guessing most of them never really think about what goes on behind the scenes. I mean, you see the six airplanes and all the noise and the pilots, but behind that, as you know, as a former commanding officer of a squadron, are all the maintenance personnel and all the other support personnel that make it happen. The CVs out at the tip of the spear, as we call it, they've got the air wing with them, but there's so much more that goes on behind it, and that is what you are up here doing today. Is that correct? Early on in my nuclear power career, there was a captain that was giving me a little bit of guidance, and he's like, hey, Pappy, you're either going to be sailing ships or you're going to be fixing ships, and so you better get good at both of them. Mm. And so in the normal life cycle of an aircraft carrier, there is an amount of time that we spend maintaining the ship and certainly upgrading the ship. Carl Vinson has been commissioned for 37 years, and so imagine the technology that has progressed in those 37 years. I was looking at an old cruise book just, a, I think, last week, and, uh, you know, with CRT tubes in the background and mm -hmm. a lot of old technology. And so we maintain the ship so that it's going to get a new coat of paint. Uh, we're going to bust all the rust and uh, preserve the ship and paint it up all nice and fresh. The uh, running gear, meaning the uh, shafting, the propellers, the rudders, they'll all get taken off and refurbished and put back on. Uh, and there's a lot of topside work as well. We call it topside work, and really that's kind of the, the preservation of the metal and uh, all the moving parts, things like that. Uh, there's a lot of... of upgrading that we're doing as well. Uh, there are ship self-defense uh, upgrades that we're getting, and uh, really we're doing a lot of changes to get ready for the air wing in the future. Okay. Well, I'll be interested to hear more about that uh, a little down the line. All right, so you are in here doing all the things that nobody ever makes movies about, but that are eminently important to maintaining a ship of this size. I mean, remind me and the listener of, of the size of an aircraft carrier as far as some of the dimensions and just how many people and, and aircraft are on it. Yeah, you bet. So the aircraft carrier is uh, 1,092 feet long. It displaces upwards of about, when it's fully loaded, of 100,000 tons. Uh, I have a complement of about 3,000 sailors that uh, uh, man train and equip uh, the aircraft carrier itself, and then when we're operational, that number will swell to about 5,200 as we embark both the air wing and uh, a couple different staffs, the mm. uh, Admiral staff, my boss, uh, the Deseron staff, and certainly the air wing is our power projection arm of the aircraft carrier, so we absolutely work together as a team when we're uh, out and about doing uh, the country's business because uh, they need us to get to go where they need to go, and we need them because they are the business end of the uh, model, if you will. Gotcha. All right. Well, just how involved is the maintenance that you're doing? I mean, just walking up to the ship, I saw a lot of scaffolding, and looks like you're in a dry dock, but how involved is it? Yeah, so it, it is <laughs> it's very involved. So in different life times in the aircraft carrier, there are different levels of maintenance. This is one of the most invasive, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so a docking availability, we are taking it essentially down to brass tacks. About 1.1 million man days worth of work. Wow. And so the ship's force is actually going to be responsible for about 25% of that. Our partners in crime are Puget Sound Naval Shipyards, and so they have got a whole fleet of artisans and craftsmen that will come in and do many of the upgrades. And then there's a, a pretty good contracting effort that's ongoing as well. And it's really the coordination of those three sort of basic entities, Ships Force, Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, and all the contractors 
that come on board the ship and uh, they'll be uh, in every nook and cranny doing all the specific jobs that they need to do to uh, get the ship ready to go. Very cool. Well, they are the ones that are doing this year in and year out. You guys come and go. Is there someone we can talk to to get a little more depth and detail on what it is they're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So my counterpart in crime is a gentleman named Mike Irby. And so he is sort of the commanding officer, if you will. We call him the project superintendent of Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. And uh, we work uh, hand in hand. I talk to him uh, multiple times every day. And uh, I got to emphasize that we couldn't do this without functioning very closely as a team. And it just tickles me pink that uh, he's such a great guy. Uh, we get along great. And uh, so that's, that's I think, who you're going to talk to next. Okay. Well, let's go find Mr. Irby. And maybe while we're at it, we'll take a look at just how much is going on on the inside and outside of this massive ship. And if it's all right with you, Skipper, maybe we'll come back around and catch you at the end. Sounds great. Looking forward to it. Okay. All right, Mr. Mike Irby, the CO, recommended we speak with you today. How are you, sir? Good, sir. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Well, thanks for coming over and grabbing the microphone. And we, as always, like to start with a little background on who people are hearing. So tell us a little bit about you, if you would, please. I'll do that. So Mike Irby, as you mentioned, uh, born in South Boston, Virginia, enlisted in the Navy back in 1984, enlisted as a Navy nuke electrician. So oh. uh, got some Navy experience there. Um, I started in the shipyard back in 1998. I started in the temporary services shop as an electrician. From there, I moved on up through the uh, ranks in the shipyard to the position which I now hold on the uh, USS Carl Vinson as the project superintendent. Okay. And how long have you been doing this? So I've been a project superintendent now going on four years. This is actually my second project as a oh. project superintendent. Okay. And did you say South Boston, Virginia? South Boston, Virginia. I know not the Boston, Boston Massachusetts. <laughs> okay. Not that Boston. So right. it's a little town in southern uh, Virginia. All right. Yeah, about 20 miles from the North Carolina border. Okay. Excellent. And how long did you spend on active duty? So I spent six years six in the years. Navy, did one that. tour and, and, and got out of the Navy. Uh, I got the experience that I thought I needed and uh, <laughs> I was ready to join the civilian All right. Well, on that one tour, as you and I were walking to the ship earlier, you told me you deployed twice. I did deploy okay. twice. I uh, actually served on board USS Nimitz. Uh, did my four years at sea on Nimitz with two, two right. uh, actually tours. There. I also did two tours. My guess is yours were before mine. So yeah. at any rate, we won't spend too much time comparing notes on that. But the Nimitz is parked right next to us here. Yes, next door. Uh, okay. She just completed a maintenance availability as well, All similar right. to the one which we're currently undergoing on Carl Vinson. Cool. And speaking of that, this is not the Carl Vinson's first time being supported by the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. Is that correct? That is correct. It is not. We have been supporting Carl Vinson in one way, shape, or form uh, since 1990, actually. Okay. And in what different types of support can you provide generally? So we provide uh, modernization support. Mm -hmm. We provide maintenance support. And uh, general upkeeps as the ship uh, arrives in home port, we provide any type of emergent work which she may need as well. Okay. So it's not just what we're going through now, but let's touch base on that a little bit. What is the scope of work, if you will, or what all is being done. I mean, just walking in here, I see scaffolding everywhere. The ship is in dry dock, so it's as dry as can be. And it looks quite extensive from my point of view. So it is quite extensive. So during this availability, we will undergo scheduled periodic maintenance on major components like rudders, shafts, and tanks. We'll upgrade crew living spaces. The ship will undergo preservation to its hull. We'll upgrade the combat system suite and prepare to support the air wing of the future as well. The planned work package for Carl Vinson is expected to include more than 1.1 million man days of work by the maintenance team, which consists of Puget Sound Naval Shipyard and Intermediate Maintenance Facility, Ships Force, and various other contractors and alteration installation teams. It's a massive undertaking. I guess. <laughs> but we're the right team for the job as we are the maintenance professionals. And we have a solid plan to succeed. Uh -huh. Teamwork among the members of PSNS and IMF and the ship is critical, both for the success of the work and the safety of everyone involved. So, and safety is paramount to our organization. Sure. So this teamwork includes over 630,000 man days of work performed by the shipyard team, 250,000 man days of work performed by ship's force, 
and over 255,000 man days of work performed by contractors and other maintenance providers. I mean, these are a lot of big numbers. I mean, I think it suffices to say we have a lot of people all working very hard for a long period of time. And in the end, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, the carrier is going to be almost as good as new, arguably better, perhaps. Yeah, I, I would say better. <laughs> um, so by the end of this project, virtually every nook and cranny on Carl Vinson will be updated and ready for the ship's next mission. So uh, among some of the larger efforts which we'll do will be I talked about the preservation efforts. Uh -huh. So we're preserving over 75 tanks on the ship. We'll be painting and refurbishing more than 700 spaces shipboard. We'll be installing over 2,000 what we call racks. They're actually bunks that our sailors sleep on while they're underway and living yeah. on the ship. Beds for normal people. Beds but for we have normal to call people. Them, we call them racks. Something different. Okay. Yes, sir. We'll be updating the electrical control system on the ship. We'll be blasting and painting the entire external surface of the ship. We will also be aligning and preserving the ship's catapults, which are utilized to, to uh, deploy the airplanes. Mm -hmm. We'll be removing and overhauling all shafts and both rudders on the ship, and we'll be installing an updated combat system suite as well. So Mike, I began my podcasting as a guest on a show about muscle cars. When I watch sometimes the television shows, you'll see a car that is taken down almost to the nut and bolt, and they will powder coat the frame, and they'll rebuild the engine, a new interior. Is that effectively what's going on here? Are we doing a frame-up restoration on the Carl Vinson? For the most part, it's very similar to what we'll be doing on Carl Vinson, going down, like you said, to mm -hmm. the nuts and bolts of, of, the, of the ship right. and refurbishing major systems, major components, and making it pretty much like new. Yeah. Well, and you said at the beginning 75 tanks. Now, in a military show like this, someone might mistakenly think like the M1, A1, Abrams tank. But I think you mean what? The water tanks and... So I'm talking about various uh, fuel tanks, various water tanks, various collection holding system tanks for okay. use by personnel when they're living on board. Okay. Because that's an important part of what we do when we're out for six, eight, sometimes longer months then we need the water, we need the fuel, and to your point, we need the racks to sleep in, and so all that gets updated and improved. But what we're not doing, correct me if I'm wrong, is replacing systems. In other words, some of the new carriers have electromagnetic technology for the catapults and arresting gear. We're not replacing steam on this ship with those, are we? We are not doing those types of upgrades on this ship, but what we are doing is uh, preserving and uh, modernizing, if you will. Sure, what already exists. Systems okay. that exist, yes. Right, okay. So that would, I would think, be a pretty massive undertaking because those other carriers are built around those new systems. And for this ship, we already have all the steam piping and everything that's required for the steam catapults. Okay. Yeah, so that's that correct. Sense. The planning that goes into the installation of those new types of systems you're referring to mm -hmm. would start at grassroots. Gotcha. All right. Now, you talked a lot about the different amounts of time that go into this with the million, I believe you said, man days and whatnot. How about the size of your staff? I mean, you are in charge of your people and what all kinds of specialties do you have? So we have all types of disciplines and trades. We have electricians, we have plumbers, we have inspectors, we have various engineers and engineering technical fields. We have pipe fitters. Sure. We have welders, I'm welders. guessing. Welders. Yeah. yeah, we have we have ship fitters, we have shipwrights. And shipwrights are a trade that builds scaffolding or, or builds wood structures. We have what we call sail loft personnel that build containments. All different types of trade disciplines are are uh, in the shipyard. Gotcha. And then on the way in, as we were looking at the ship, you were describing how the actual dry docking process works, and you talked about divers. Are there certain specialties that maybe you only need once for the entire maintenance period, and so you just bring in somebody, or are they still your people and they just don't work very often? Based on the amount of work which we have at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, we have the luxury of having these trained technicians be full-time employed. We may only need divers a few times during our availability, but because of the fact that we have so much work at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, we are able to employ them full time around awesome. the clock. Excellent. Now, does the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard offer the training for someone who maybe is willing to work and has good credentials, but not as a welder? I mean, will you train a welder or? 
Puget Sound Naval Shipyard has many uh, training opportunities. They have a mm. a nationally renowned apprentice program, okay. as well as various helper courses, which students can go to school, uh, get training, and uh, better learn their discipline. Sure. Yeah. And then are they stuck in that, or is there a room for upward mobility within the shipyard? They can start off as that, maybe move to management, or maybe even move to another specialty? So there are many opportunities for folks to, to move to different uh disciplines in their careers. They can start off in an apprenticeship as a pipe fitter and could end up as a supervisor for the electricians if they see fit. Of course, it's, uh, it's, it's highly suggested that if, if the investment is made as a pipe fitter, that we would uh, want you to be a pipe fitter, sure. of course, but uh, <laughs> if that's what you wanted to do. Right. But, uh, but there are many opportunities for folks to, to come from a, a lower level mechanic to rise to the ranks of uh, management like I have. Right. That's where I started. Actually. Okay. Excellent. And as far as, you know, I've had questions on my show before about how big is the rivalry between, like back when we had F-14s, you know, the F-14 squadrons and the other squadrons. I was always F-18s. And my answer was, it's, it's fun, but it's not serious. Do you see much of any consternation or rivalry or any issues between the ship's crew and your crews? I, I don't see that. One thing we do to alleviate that in the planning process, the project team, we go out and we actually live with the ship on two or three occasions, oh. get to know the ship, plan plan the uh, availability with the ship, mm -hmm. and that really helps with any rivalry or, or any of sure. those things that we have to do. We really understand that it's a team effort. Right. We all have a single goal. Our job as the maintenance professionals is to sharpen the spear so that the ship can utilize the spear appropriately when they need to. That's right. And so can the Navy and the United States of America. Well, Mike, right. thanks very much for your time. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you would like the general public, particularly taxpaying Americans, to know about your crew and, and what we do up here? The one thing I would say about Puget Sound Naval Shipyard and Intermediate Maintenance Facility, um, our partnership with Ships Force and our teamwork with the contractors and other maintenance providers is we're very good at what we do. We have a long history of providing excellent maintenance for our Navy vessels. And our number one goal is to make sure that Carl Vinson is ready for his next deployment in order to meet his future missions. Well, it sounds like you guys are doing it well. Now, once this eventually gets out of here, and it's hard to put a time on that, will you have some downtime, or does another one pull right in behind it? So that, uh, that time after the avail, I, I will take a little bit of time off to spend with the family. Sure. I, uh, <laughs> I work pretty hard during the avail, but that's just who uh -huh. I am. Um, but we will have another project come in. We'll be uh, planning the next project, and we'll be going right into the planning phase. Okay. So it is, uh, we definitely don't get to go to Hawaii for six months and not do anything. <laughs> we stay at it. Like I said, we're maintenance professionals, and this is what we do for a living. Well, you do it well, and you are a national asset. I mean, we could not go do, like you said so eloquently, what we do out at the tip of the spear if you don't spend some time sharpening it. So, Mike, thanks very much for your time. I've really learned a lot, and I hope the listener has too. All right. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. All right, Skipper. Well, we're back, and boy, you are right. Mr. Mike Irby is a great guy, but also it was just amazing to take a walk around this gargantuan vessel and just marvel at the technology. I mean, it makes you proud. A giant ship made out of steel that floats, that still boggles my mind. You would think the thing would sink being made out of steel, but the size of the screws or propellers, the, just the size of the hull that I've never seen after 25 years in five deployments, never seen it in dry dock, that was pretty impressive. And I'm just amazed at the extensive work being performed. Yeah, it is pretty amazing. You know, a large piece of this availability is just the sheer coordination that has to happen uh, so that, you know, we don't get too many folks into one space at the same time. And so lots of coordination meetings. Like I said uh, earlier in the day, uh, Mike and I talk every day. We've got our uh, assistants with us. And, you know, our job is really to make sure that we're breaking down those barriers to make sure that the guys that are actually turning the wrenches can do their jobs as efficiently as, and as effectively as possible. Mm, and speaking of that, I had no idea that the ship's crew was part of this. I mean, normally these are the guys underway that are preparing meals, operating the flight operation systems, navigating, fighting the ship, firefighting if necessary. I mean, they're all an integral part of this overhaul, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. So we bust a lot of rust ourselves. <laughs> and a lot of the upgrades to the berthings, for example, 
you know, we're fixing the ship up to make the quality of life for our sailors better. And that falls squarely on the shoulders of our sailors, which makes sense. At least to me, it does. <laughs> you know, we do everything from valve maintenance to tank work. We partition the entire crew up into teams and we will have a door team whose only responsibility is to find all the doors that are broken and take them off the ship, get them over to a barge to rehab them, and then put them back on. Same thing for the valve team. We've got a deck and tile team and on and on. And a lot of that labor is directly on the backs of my sailors. When you add in the fact that, uh, hey, guess what? We're still in the Navy. So there is an amount of overhead associated with being in the Navy in the Mm -hmm. form of, of standing duty and your military obligations. They're doing all of that as well. And when we get back to uh, doing the nation's business here at the end of the availability, they still have to be trained and ready to go. And so a lot of what we plan out as well is how to get those guys to the next school, to the next training, to EDD, to another aircraft carrier so their skills don't atrophy to the point where, uh, you know, we're starting from ground zero. So uh, it is absolutely a large effort for the crew to make sure that they get done in and out of the shipyard and we're still able to uh, operate the ship. And it's so important because, like you said, you're really almost wearing two hats. You're repairing the vessel and refurbishing and upgrading it, but you're also, like you said, keeping your own spear sharp, so to speak, as far as whatever specialty you might have. So I can see where this can be a arguably difficult time for the crew because there's so much going on. And it's not necessarily what people join the Navy to do, but it's still imminently important. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the morale in the shipyard is always tough. I'll be, uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, you know, the, the young men and women that we have on the ship, they, uh, they join the Navy. They want to go see the world. Uh, they want to they wanna get out on deployment and go uh, do all those great things you get to do on deployment. Mm-hmm. And yet they find themselves here. And so... Uh, we pay particular attention to that. Um, you know, really, what I, I view my job is uh, creating the conditions so that my sailors can succeed. Sure. So, you know, my contract with them is uh, they get to work on time. We keep them gainfully employed right. and not sitting around. Uh, and then when it's time to knock off, we knock off, and then they can go. Um, so a uh, young crew, maybe uh, average 20 22, maybe 23 years old. And so uh, when they're out and about in town, they can do 22 or 23 (laughs) year old type of activities. And some of them uh, are maybe not the best for uh, their career. And so the other thing we try very hard to do is we try to provide many, many different opportunities uh, to go do all the great things that are out here in the Pacific Northwest. We have a couple vans, we take folks hiking, uh, we have uh, community relation events. Uh, there's a great MWR program that uh, affords them the opportunity to go to a Seahawks game or a Mariners game uh, and to see all the great things there are to do in Seattle and Tacoma and here in Bremerton. And so, uh, yeah, it's tough, but uh, so far the crew is doing an absolutely outstanding job. Uh, I'm super proud of them. Fantastic. Yeah, did I hear correctly? Are you training to climb a particular mountain nearby or something? <laughs> yeah, you bet. So, uh, you know, you uh, if you get get up here in this uh, part of the world on a clear day, you can't help but notice uh, Mount Rainier. Mm-hmm. And uh, I climbed that mountain when I was 16 for the first time. Oh, wow. And I've been up it, uh, I guess, a half a dozen times since then, once with uh, my platoon and SEAL Team 2. And... Uh, it's just seemed like a pretty good goal to uh, to kind of focus uh, our energies, our workout energies, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, so that this summer we can, uh, you know, strap on a pair of crampons and, and get up to the top of that thing. Well, it's a great parallel for what you're trying to do here as far as climbing the mountain on refurbishing the Carl Vinson because it's step by step, day by day, and it's important work. And it sounds like you guys are doing it. Now, when the Carl Vinson is complete with this maintenance period, although you call it an availability period, yep. uh, she will not only be refurbished and renovated with new bunks and racks and so much more, but really more lethal. Absolutely. So 
I've got a stack over on my desk of about 50 ECDs, they're called, uh, Engineering Change Documents. Okay. And uh, that is just sort of a synopsis of all the work that's going on on the ship. And there are little things like, hey, we're going to cut out a pad eye over here. And there are really big things like, uh, for example, you know, taking apart the, uh, the rudder and the screws and refurbishing them, mm. painting the entire ship. And so in the middle there are 15 to 20 uh, engineering change documents that are getting uh, the ship specifically ready for the air wing of the future. And uh, the air wing that we deploy with next is not going to be the same air wing that we deployed with uh, back in 2018. Well, even when you and I came into the Navy, it looked a lot different. I mean, when we first deployed, there were still S3s, F14s, EA6Bs. I mean, those are three that are gone. What am I missing? Uh, ES3s, yep. I guess. But yep. what will the air wing of the future look like? Yeah, so first and foremost, I guess uh, uh, I have to talk about uh, F35 Charlie. Okay. Uh, it's the Joint Strike Fighter, Navy's first stealth fighter, fifth generation long range. Uh, it's a pretty badass aircraft. It brings a lot of capability, it, no doubt about it. It really does. Okay. So you can't just land the thing on here and off you go? There's more that needs to be done? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot more that needs to be done. For example, uh, you know, we have to uh, take a look at our jet blast deflectors oh. and uh, just beef those up a little bit. It's a single engine aircraft, as you know, pretty big engine. And so we just got to make sure we've got the right cooling flow. Okay. It's things like that that the fleet integration team uh, has taken a look at uh, and putting together these uh, engineering changes so that we can, you know, operate the F-35 uh, very well right out of the gate. All right. What other aircraft might be in the air wing of the future? Yeah, so there's the uh, CMV-22, the Osprey. So mm -hmm. this is that big tilt rotor sure. aircraft, and that's going to replace uh, the COD, the carrier onboard delivery. The C-2. Uh, yeah, the mm -hmm. C-2. Uh, and so that's a, that airframe is getting pretty old, and so the Osprey is going to uh, replace it. It's uh, new. Uh, it's got longer legs. It's a pretty, pretty capable aircraft, and so uh, it'll be exciting to see it uh, back on the ship. Sure. And then I have to think that some part of the air wing of the future will be platforms already present, such as the Super Hornet, the Growler, perhaps each with incremental changes to their own airframes. But uh, any other aircraft uh, changes or anything interesting? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you're, at, you're, you're right. We'll have uh, our, our, uh, our squadrons of Super Hornets as well, both single and, uh, and two-seat variants. Uh, along with the E2D. And so uh, the E2 is a uh, venerable oil aircraft. It's been around for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, despite all the upgrades, it still looks the same. It's still got the, <laughs> the, the, the dome on top. Uh, the Delta is, uh, is, first of all, it's our newest variant. Uh, it's got a state-of-the-art radar. Uh, it's probably a, a two-generation leap in the capability. And uh, gone are the days that, uh, that the operator in the back of the E-2 is looking at a scope and talking to uh, a single airplane. Uh, you have to really, uh, when you talk about the E-2D, you really have to think battle space management now. Okay. Uh, and the processing power, the technology inherent uh, in all our platforms, including the E-2D, is really uh, all that information is getting networked together. That's amazing. So not only will the Carl Vinson be more lethal and refurbished and more effective, but so will the embarked air wing. And that's going to be quite a formidable force when it deploys. Yeah, absolutely. In, in my humble opinion, I think uh, when Carl Vinson reconstitutes the air wing, uh, then we'll, we'll go on deployment. It will literally be the most lethal aircraft carrier uh, and air wing team that's ever deployed. Now, on a personal note, Pappy, will you get a chance to see that? I know tours on a carrier <laughs> as a CO can be kind of fleeting. Are you going to spend most of it in the shipyard, unfortunately? Uh, you know, it, unfortunately, I am. Uh, I'll okay. go back to what I said before. You're either, you're either sailing <laughs> ships or you're fixing ships. Right. Uh, I got some great sea time out, out on the front side. You know, RIMPAC was an absolutely sure. great experience. Uh, Sustex, all the CQs, watching the uh, uh, all the new guys uh carrier qualify is actually very uh, enjoyable. Good. It really is. 
And uh, so, yeah, so anyway, so up here now, uh, on into uh, 2020, and I think uh, I'll have the opportunity to uh, to get some more seat time on the backside. Hmm. Uh, how deep into workups that's going to go is okay. anybody's guess, but well, certainly not to deployment. We'll have to keep in touch with you um, and, and see how that goes. All right. You bet. Well, I asked the same question to Mike Irby, so I'd like to ask you if you don't mind, because... Really, we talked a lot on this particular episode about sharpening the spear and a lot yeah. of this unglamorous, unheralded, unHollywood-ish effort that goes into it. What would you want the taxpaying general public to know about the Navy's men, women, and equipment, specifically in terms to the Carl Vinson and this availability period? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I guess really what I'd like to the American folks to know is uh, their investment is uh, is a terrific return uh, with respect to the defense of uh, the United States. Uh, you know, the, the ship and Puget Sound, uh, the contractors, we have gotten off to certainly the best start in an availability I've ever seen. Uh, six weeks into production now, and uh, we're banging away on all cylinders. The work is getting done. We're on timeline. And uh, uh, when, when we get all this work done, we're out the backside. Uh, you'll see uh, a re-energized ship, a re-energized crew, uh, a more lethal air wing, uh, and on into workups. It's uh, a terrific return on the investment. I bet. And Carl Vinson will be prepared to sail another several years and and continue to provide for freedom of navigation and all the things that aircraft carriers do and have done for, gosh, almost 100 years by now, seems like. That's awesome. All right, Pappy. Well, golly, thanks for your time today. What's the future hold for you? I mean, we talked about your role here, but after that, are you going to keep playing the game? I mean, you start looking at stars much higher than the rank you're at now. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I've, I've always uh, tried to maintain uh, that if I'm still having fun and enjoying uh, my career and that it's rewarding, then I will continue to, uh, to you know, to keep uh, playing the keep, game, right? Keep on keeping on, yeah. you know. Um, at some point, uh, somebody's going to tap me on the shoulder and say, "Hey, Pappy, <laughs> it's time to get off the treadmill." <laughs> and uh, which one of those two things happens first? I don't know, but uh, I will tell you right now. Uh, even though we're in a shipyard, uh, I just, I just love it. I love talking to the the young men and women on the ship. I love to see the great things they're doing every day, and. Uh, and so, uh, from my perspective, uh, I, I don't see an end in sight. Excellent. Well, that is fantastic. Now, how many years of service are you up to at this point? Uh, I think I'm up to 34. <laughs> Holy smokes. Yeah, long that time. might be a new record for the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I'll have to check. <laughs> well, if I may be so bold, on behalf of your 3,000 sailors, I'd like to thank you for your leadership. On behalf of freedom-loving people everywhere, I want to thank you for 34 years as both a SEAL and a pilot and a leader all around. I mean, that's impressive. And so thank you for that. Thanks for your time today. And before I let you go, however, you've listened to the show. You know the deal. <laughs> oh, yeah. we, ne- we need to know how someone came up with Pappy. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. I wish I had a better story for you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, after by the time I got into flight school, uh, I, as you know, uh, had a few years of, of enlisted time, and so I I showed up to flight school with a wife and uh, a couple kids, and so a little bit older, uh, more focused maybe on uh, going home and uh, hanging out with uh, my son and daughter, than uh, some of the other sort of normal exploits in in uh, flight school, mm-hmm. and uh, hence Pappy. Uh, and then when I got to my first Geo Squadron, I just managed not to do anything stupid enough to get a change. <laughs> that comes up quite frequently on yeah. this show, so that's as good of an uh, answer as I can get. Yeah. And I think it's very similar to the other Pappy who we had on the show who spoke of aircraft carriers, except with his, it had a little bit to do with his Hispanic um, heritage yeah. and uh, the way his children uh, addressed him at a particular function, I believe it was. Roger. So, Awesome, Pappy. Well, thanks very much for your time today and telling us about what it means to make sure that the spear is sharp when we need it. And unless you got any parting shots, I think we can wrap this up and get out of here. No, I'm good. Uh, Hey, Jello, thanks again for coming up here. It was great to talk to you. And uh, and yeah, I'm out on this end. Awesome. 
Hey, Jello, what an interview. So I loved hearing both from Mike and from Pappy. And holy cow, Pappy, man, what, 34 years? Is that right of service? Holy cow, yes. A Navy SEAL, an aviator, a nuke, as we call them, and now an aircraft carrier CO. What a hero. And of course, he's about to go climb uh, Mount Rainier there in the Pacific Northwest. So, you know, that was a really interesting interview. They invited me up and I was so glad to do that. And I hope that their sailors and the shipyard staff there, that they understand how important their job is because it is so crucial for that carrier to go back out. Is it going to be a movie? No, probably not. Not even getting a lot of attention, but it's so vitally important to what they do. And I just want to comment on if parts of the conversation sounded a little choppy, we did end up with some audio challenges I had to work through, but also they had to be very careful. They had to talk to their bosses about what they can and mm -hmm. cannot share on a show like this. Because as with, for example, our air to air weapons episode several months back, we have to be careful not to give away too much to our potential adversaries. And so the precise amount of time, the precise work they're doing, the precise dollars and man hours and all that, they had to be a little bit vague because we just don't want to show too much of our hand. Yeah, the carrier is a, I guess an understatement would be that it's a national asset, right? So you absolutely, you don't want to spill the beans or what we call break operational security or OPSEC. Right. And so they were very cautious about that. But another thing that's interesting, Sunshine, is that most of our aircraft carriers today, including the one you were just out on, the Theodore Roosevelt, are named for former presidents. Now, this one is not. What can you tell us about who Carl Vinson was? Yeah, good old Carl Vinson. And I didn't know much about him till recently, but he was one of the longest serving U.S. congressmen. He uh, originated from Georgia and he served for 51 years. So from 1914 to wow. 1965. Yeah. He was the lead author of the Two Ocean Navy Act of 1940, which was instrumental in providing the capabilities that allow the U.S. to fight a successful World War II, specifically in the Pacific Theater. Is he had a profound effect on developing modern Navy carrier-centered doctrine. So this guy was uh, obviously a very big advocate of Navy and an even bigger advocate of the carrier Navy. And hence, he uh, has a ship named after him. Well, what greater honor is there than that in that regard? And how appropriate for this episode, because he's behind the scenes. Most people have never heard of him, but he was getting it done so that everyone else could go out and fight the battles that are so well documented uh, in World War II. Absolutely, Jello. Cool. All right. Well, we will add any new terms that we might have to the usual glossary. And again, I want to thank Skipper Pappy and the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard for hosting me up there to check out the Carl Vinson. And again, I just hope everyone understands how maybe unromantic, unsexy it is, but how vitally important it is to have these availability periods, as they put it. Okay, hey Jello, shifting gears just a tad. So what's going on with Patreon these days? Ah, uh, yes. We move this to the end of the episodes now. We have two new division leads, John Gibson and Cam Nichols. We have new strike lead, Joseph Penny, and new mission commander, Mark Avent, and a new air boss, that's David Fine. Now, Sunshine, the mission commanders and air bosses, as you may know, have one of their perks being a 30-minute either Skype or telephone conversation with me, and in future months, what we might do is uh, get you on the horn of these Excellent. guys as well. I would love to. And yeah, I had a chance to talk with one of our air bosses, Jimmy, the other day, mm -hmm. and he was really cool. He's an enthusiastic dude. He was in uh, some special warfare stuff earlier in his life, but he says he listens to the show with his nine-year-old son. So they're not expecting this, but I just wanted to give a shout out to Jude, who also listens to the show. Jude, thanks for being a Fighter Pilot Podcast listener, and I hope you grow up and serve your country someday like your dear old dad and your friends here on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you, Jude, and thank you, Jimmy. Absolutely. And all our Patreon supporters, which if you are unfamiliar, head on over to patreon.com. Look for the Fighter Pilot Podcast. And there you can gain access to exclusive content or early access to episodes and help support the show in the process. Well, at this point, I always like to remind the listeners that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense 
or its components. Now, Sunshine, we're going to return to the aircraft series next episode, and I believe we are featuring another solo interview with you, right? Yeah, you kind of pushed me out of the nest again. I enjoy it. It was a, a, a local guy here, and all I'm going to say is that he piloted a very fierce Vietnam-era fighter. Excellent. Well, we will have our fun with that on Instagram, sending out some teasers, see if people can figure it out leading into the show. And we'll see you for that around June 12th. In the meantime, I think we can wrap it up and get out of here. What do you say, Sunshine? Sounds like a plan. See you. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line, 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show. And don't forget, share us with your network. Thanks for listening. I love the underwear comment. I hope you keep it. (laughs) (laughs) I probably will, just for fun. Oh, that's awesome. Okay.